G'day everyone and welcome back to our off-grid travel series. Alright, so this episode that we're going to be covering today is planning and logistics. What does the nitty gritty of deciding where we camp, how long we camp, what resources we need like water, fuel, all those things, like how does that actually work when you're traveling around Australia? Yep, the apps, the maps, everything else that we use to plan all that out and, uh, and how we sort of go about making sure that we can get into the places that we want to get to with a big caravan. Um, all of these questions came through when we hit you guys up on our social media channels on Facebook and Instagram. So we're also giving away a $100 gift card to the Everything Caravan and Camping website, which literally has thousands of things for everything, everything caravan and camping. Uh, at the end of this episode, stick around, we'll give you the details. Alrighty, we're coming to you from fourth in Tassie. It's actually the end of our Tassie adventure. We're getting back on the spirit of Tasmania tomorrow. It has gone so fast, it's unbelievable. Uh, we'll be sharing in an upcoming video, obviously the rest of our Tassie travels, but also uh, all our tips and advice and what we thought of our Tassie adventure, how long should you come for, uh, where should you go, all those sorts of things, weather, everything everything you wanna know about planning your trip to Tassie. So that's coming up on the channel as well. If you're not subscribed, Hit that subscribe button that'll be the first step of going into that drawer as well for that hundred dollar gift voucher so you might as well get that out of the way and uh check out all the other cool stuff we've got coming up on the channel this year well congratulations to mel and ryan from trucked off round oz you guys are the winner of the hundred dollar everything caravan and camping voucher from our safety and security video so we'll leave a comment for you on your comment you left on that video but if you'd also like to reach out to us, just send me an email, Simon at thelifestylepioneers.com. And we'll get that voucher to you. Yes. Happy spending. Can't wait to hear what you guys spend that $100 on. Send us an email and let us know when you do spend it so that we uh, can see what you guys went and grabbed yourselves. So, yeah, congratulations, Mel and Ryan. So when it comes to planning, to be completely honest, we're not the biggest planners. We really like to remain as flexible as possible with our travel plans and not plan too much. But with that said, we do obviously have some sort of plan when it comes to, to where we're gonna go and what we're gonna see. Yeah. So we sort of broke it up into three, I guess, stages of planning. We've got our big overall long-term plan that's sort of a year or more. Uh, that's basically just like our, our general direction that we're gonna be traveling, um, what state we're gonna be traveling in, what season, you know, whether we're gonna be up north, down south, just that general idea and a general direction of travel. Next is gonna be like our, so I guess, like our, our medium term plans, I guess. Yeah, so for example, like at the moment we're in Tasmania and that might be in the medium term plan that we know we wanna go say anti-clockwise around Tasmania to avoid the school holidays on the East Coast. So yeah, it's really just a state and then a direction. Yeah, so it's more like the next few months, I guess, what we're doing on the next few months. And then obviously, or even even probably shorter than that, maybe even the next few weeks. And then shorter than that is is the day-to-day -day sort of planning. Now, often we won't know where we're going next before we leave a campsite. Often it's the day before or the night before, sometimes the morning of that we're actually <laughs> leaving, uh, that we decide to have a bit of a look. And Some... sometimes we don't. We just hit the road with, no, with just a general direction and we'll figure it out as we go. That's what I was going to say. Sometimes we're filling the water tanks up on our way going, how long do we need to last for? And like, all right, we better come up with something now. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And that's just the way we like to travel. That I'm sure gives some people anxiety, but that's that's just how we like to do it. So I think a big part of it is just figuring out what's going to suit you and, and the way you want to travel. But for us, um, yeah, it's really a lot of... Uh, just figuring it out as we go. We don't often go into a campsite knowing exactly how long we're gonna stay. Sometimes we'll have in, in mind, you know, three or four days here might be nice, or maybe we'll stop for a week somewhere mm -hmm. or something like that. But we don't generally have, you know, five days on the dot and on the fifth day we leave no matter what. Uh, we often extend stays, we occasionally shorten them, although more often than not, we tend to extend them. Uh, but yeah, it's, it, we generally try and keep things very flexible and that, that's our recommendation. That's what suits us. And I think it suits most people, just about any other traveler you talk to, 
they enjoy travel less the more stuff they've got booked in or more hard dates i suppose that they're restricted to we found that a real challenge just with tasmania because we had to have obviously the ferry uh, over and back booked because it's so hard to get onto that ferry that's uh, been a really different style of travel for us down here in tassie and it's not i wouldn't say it's ruined it but it definitely does take away from that just free flexible style of travel the other thing to take into consideration is that we travel full time and that if you only have one year you might want to um, you might want to book more things in or have a more of a plan and I think then again the more the shorter your time the more you probably want to plan that out so just so you prioritize like make sure you get what you actually want would you agree like if you've only got two weeks in Tasmania you, you might want to book ahead to the to make sure you get the places you want to get to yeah and, and um, it depends where you are it, it all of this really depends on where you are where you are in the country and how long you've got to travel yeah the number one app that we use on a daily basis well in fact more than a daily basis it's just the bible of apps if you don't have the wikicamp app get yourself the Wikicamp app. I think it's about eight bucks and it'll pay for itself in the first night that you find a free camp <laughs> where has, you wouldn't have otherwise. Yeah, it has saved us a ridiculous amount of money, I would say, in just the amount of free camps that we wouldn't have known about. Yep. And just time wasted trying to find where we want to go and what resources we need. And the big thing with the Wikicamps app that you may, not, may or may not be aware of is that it's a useful for so much more than just finding campsites obviously yeah. wiki camps is in the name but it is the traveler's app of choice because it has just about everything that a traveler needs in the one app so it's going to be how you find dump points how you find water fill points how you find uh rubbish hikes. bins <laughs> hikes points of interest, interest things to go and see uh everything is in there and it's a community-based app so the traveling community contributes to it, puts their reviews into it. You're going to find out fees and information like that. It has photos of where you're going, like up-to-date, reasonable photos yep. left by other travelers. So if you went to this campsite here, say, and you wanted to say, oh, where is that place in Forth? Listen, Simon, we're talking about. You go to the Forth Recreation Ground. You can have a look. It tells you what facilities are there. It tells you photos that other travelers have taken. So you can see, is it going to be suitable for your sort of car, caravan, set up, tent, whatever. And it's also going to have reviews. Yep. So that's another great thing is that travelers leave reviews on how good a campsite is, who it's suitable for, what they did or didn't like. Yeah, that's right. So the downside to it being a, a community-based thing is you, you're going to want to fact check some stuff. So things <laughs> like fees and things like that might not always be up to date. Uh, there may be information on there that just that isn't correct. So it is worth reading through those reviews and just figuring out what the general uh, indication is of that site. You would have seen in our, if you watched our safety and security video, it's a big part of how we determine the safety uh, or the security of a campsite that we're considering. But also it's how we figure out whether we can get in there or not. Uh, you can read the reviews and find out that sort of thing. We'll talk more about that later in this video. It's, it's just a super handy app for getting a really good general idea of uh, what a place is going to be like or where you're going to be able to get resources and things like that. So yeah, Wikicamps is, is by far the, the most useful app that we use. The other great thing about Wikicamps is that you can have a favourite section. So we love this because whenever we're on Instagram, Facebook, uh, watching other YouTube, if we see a campsite that we like the look of, we go into our Wikicamp app, find the campsite, just search for it, and then love heart it. So after years of travelling, we now have hundreds of favourited campsites that means we don't have to remember where all those good spots are in the NT, where those good spots are in, you know, the Flinders Ranges. Oh, where was that campsite? I can literally just turn the filter on, show me love-hearted only, and I know that I've already checked that that's a cracking campsite and I want to go there. It sounded like a bloody ad for Wikicamps now. Let us know in the comments if you're a regular Wikicamps user, if you've never used it before. Should we do a whole video uh, explaining exactly how Wikicamps use and how we get the most out of it? Let us know, but that gives you a bit of an idea of how useful the app can be. We'll touch a bit more later on in this video of some of the other features that we use Wikicamps for, uh, but that really gives you a good idea of that. Apart from Wikicamps, or if you, there's a campsite that you're trying to find that isn't on Wikicamps, what else do we use? So mainly around station stays and farm stays. 
Hip Camp is basically a listing of private campgrounds. So they're all paid campgrounds and they're generally uh, just pieces of land that people have that they're offering up for campers to use. There's a whole different range of them from glamping tents and, and accommodation right down to just free camping and basic no facilities camping. We generally find that a lot of the ones, particularly the smaller farms and things like that, will tend to be listed on hip camp. Some are listed both on hip camp and on wiki camps, but the bigger station stays, we generally find them uh, pretty well listed on wiki camps. But that is another app that you can use as well to help you find campsites. The other main app that we use on a regular or, yeah, very regular basis is the Fuel Map app. It's where we get all our stats from. If you've ever seen our stats posts that you guys seem to love on our Facebook and Instagram when we post those about uh, how much fuel we've bought, how many kilometers we've done, what our average consumption is, all that sort of thing. There is a logbook function inside the fuel map app. So again, it's not just for finding the cheapest or the best fuel in the area. It's also really, really handy for logging your trip. If you're a bit of a uh, stats nerd like me, that's the easiest way I've found to do it. And you would be amazed at some of the differences between fuel stations within the same town. Like we found 30 cent difference in the same town just by using the fuel map app. And it often means too, we can look ahead and see what fuel prices are doing. So if they're cheaper where we are, we know to fill up early, or if we know they're gonna get cheaper where we're going, we can hold off and fuel up when it gets a little bit cheaper. It, like Liz said, it can make a significant difference where you fuel up, sometimes in the same town, sometimes only 50 Ks down the road, and the fuel price can be, yeah, tens of cents difference, which when you're buying 140 litres at a time and you use as much fuel as we do, really, adds really up adds quickly. up. And I would say, just quickly on that too, maximize your discounts on fuel. Yes. Do your research on what fuel discounts you can um, add together and things like that. We find Coles Express has been crazy lately, the discounts you can get there by spending some money in, at Coles, obviously you're getting your four cents, spending some money in store, you can get another 10 cents. And if you've got a linked account like we do for your tolls, uh, you get another four cents and you can add them all together. So 18 cents off a litre, it's insanely good. Apart from all these digital and online apps and things that we use, you guys would know if you've been watching us for a while that I'm also a massive fan of paper maps and guides. Uh, there's just something about maps that I, I don't know, I just nerd out on them, I love them. So I do also carry a whole range of paper maps and guides, particularly for certain areas in the country where there's a whole lot to see and do. Um, I'm a big fan of HEMA maps, so I've got a lot of them, but I also have rooftops. So rooftops are really good if you're in the sort of high country in the Kosciuszko region and things like that. They do a really good range. There's also uh, West Print maps that are quite good as well in some of the desert regions. I don't have one of them with me. Um, a big Australia-wide map like this one is really good for just your general overall planning. It's just so much easier to spread it out on the table or on the bed or something like that or across the bonnet and get a really good idea of the where you are in, in big general terms. Uh, we also carry a HEMA road atlas with us all the time, just for times when uh, maps, digital maps or your online maps might be down. Uh, and then I also carry a heap of these guides depending on what areas we're traveling to. So this is the Vic High Country one by HEMA. Uh, we've also used their Kimberley one we were there, the Flinders Ranges one, they're the great one in Cape York. Uh, we've just bought one for the desert regions of the country that we're gonna be traveling to this year. So the, I find them really, really good. Um, I'm, I'm a massive fan of HEMA maps. If you are interested in buying HEMA maps uh, and you want to support this channel, I do have a link below that means we get a little kickback on those. But um, yeah, obviously I've been using them as you can tell by the state of these maps, I've been using them for years. Apart from all of those for finding places to go and see, it's kind of like in our safety and security video, uh, it's just word of mouth, chatting to other travelers, chatting to locals. Uh, that's how we find a whole lot of places to stay as well as a whole lot of points of interest and day use areas and things like that to go and check out. So be friendly, have a chat to other travellers and you'd be amazed at the things you can find out. So we got a heap of questions when we put the call out about filming this series about how we figure out whether we can get our 20 foot, 21 foot caravan into a place, how we go about making sure tracks we go down, that we're gonna be able to get down them, how we go about just in general, the physical size that our rig is, how we go about I guess making sure we can get into somewhere and that we can get back out again. Like in the safety and security video, a lot of this is gonna come down to your risk tolerance and your confidence in handling the rig that you're towing. So I'm quite confident at reversing in tricky situations. I'm not, I don't get a lot of anxiety about getting stuck somewhere where I've got to do quite a, uh, a tricky maneuver, I guess, to get back out again. If you've watched our travel videos for a while, way back when we are up in James Price Point, we got ourselves into an absolute pickle trying to do a three, well, not ended up being a lot more than a three point turn on soft sand, got horrendously bogged, 
That for us is just part and parcel of the adventure. It's just part of the exploration. If that's not a situation you want to get yourself into, then you're probably going to have to be a little bit more careful about where you go and things like that. Going back to wiki camps, again, it's a great resource for this. You can read through the reviews, see who's been in there, what they'll often talk, people will often talk about what size caravan they've been able to get into, the, into that place and things like that. As Liz said earlier, use those filters to filter out uh, any sites that may not be suitable for the rig that you're towing. Uh, if it's only camper trailer suitable, for example, you're probably not gonna get a 21 foot caravan into there. With all that being said though, everyone's risk tolerance is different, like I said. So someone might be saying, no, they're not prepared to take their 20 foot van in there, but I've been able to get ours in there. Uh, Notch Point's a great example for this. There's a lot of different people talking about what's possible to get into that site and what's not. That one, as an example, we, our friends got their 24 foot on-road caravan into Notch Point. So I figure if they can get in, anyone can. But that being said, they weren't too stressed about doing a little bit of minor damage or scraping the bottom and things like that. If that's not you, maybe don't tackle it. So you can sort of see where I'm going with there that it's gonna come down a lot to your risk tolerance. Now, when it comes to checking what tracks it's safe to go down and things like that, again, it's gonna come down to uh, how confident you are turning around and how getting back out of there, if it does get a bit tight or get a bit sticky. Um, I'm not too worried about running you know, branches and stuff down the side of our caravan. The fiberglass is ex extremely tough and we do have a protective film on our windows, something that we're gonna be offering uh, to all of you guys very, very soon. We're working hard to get that released. Uh, we had a few delays with that. I know there's a few of you out there waiting for it, but it is gonna be a protection film, a DIY kit that you can put on your caravan windows to protect them from scratches because they are pretty susceptible to that. So yes, sometimes I do get out and walk it. We have also used our drone in the past to scout ahead to check for tracks. So checking that the track's suitable to get the caravan down, that if it does get tight, that there's somewhere to turn around, particularly if the track's wet and boggy, or if we think it goes into a dead end. The drone can also be fantastic in a crowded camp area to find a free campsite, as in a campsite that is available so that we can go and camp on it. Uh, we fly the drone to it, hover it over the spare site, and then we can actually see the drone and drive to it and use it like a navigator beacon. So drones can be really handy well beyond uh, just filming and photography. They come in really, really handy. The other one, again, is just talking to other travelers, other people that have been there or locals in the area, having a chat to to them about where you're intending to travel and whether they think you uh, would be able to get in with the size vehicle and rig that you've got. So it can be something that's quite stressful, particularly if you're relatively new to towing. But as I said, it's all gonna come down on building your confidence and gradually getting more confident with reversing and maneuvering your caravan in tight spaces or your trailer or whatever it is you might be towing and just taking it easy and uh, figuring out and making sure you're just keeping within your own, uh, I guess your own risk tolerance is what it really is gonna come down to. All right, so one of the next questions we got asked quite a fair bit was, uh, how long do you spend in each campsite? How far can you travel each day? How many kilometers can you drive with the caravan on? All these kinds of questions. Unfortunately, to answer that, it's like, how long is a piece of string? There are so many factors that you're gonna to wanna to factor into that decision. How long have you got to travel? Are you want a complete lifestyle change like us and traveling full time and working? Have you got kids that you need to fa uh, that you need to factor in their needs for both social and academic schooling and things like that? Have you got pets? All of these things are all going to come into play when it comes to how long you're going to spend. Our ideal for us, remembering that we homeschool, work, and film on the road, that we need to factor all these three things in, as long with you know all the other daily goings on that happens in a family of four. We like to spend at least three nights because by the time you arrive set up, go for spend a day exploring, spend another day resting, you then pack it up and going off again. So for us, we need to spend at least three. So we find that obviously every now and then we'll do just a quick overnighter if we're on the way to somewhere and there's nothing to see and do. For example, along the Nullarbor, uh, there's some fantastic camping along the Nullarbor and I would really encourage everyone when you're doing the Nullarbor to travel quite slowly and, and just enjoy the drive because there's so much to see and do. But the camping isn't what you would describe as an incredible campsite where you want to spend you know, a week at a time. They're great little overnighters, enjoy a sunset, look at the view, but there's not much to do there. So you're generally moving every day. So apart from those times when we are just doing a quick overnight, I generally, like Liz said, three nights allows us a couple of days 
in a place before we have to pack up and get on the road again. What we found when we first started is we kept a much faster pace and you wear yourself out. If you've only got limited time, you might be prepared to do that to get in and see and do as much as you possibly can. But in general, we find if you're doing that where you're just setting up, going and exploring, packing up, driving, setting up, going exploring, packing up, driving, you will tire of that very quickly and you'll just find you need to add in a few rest days where you don't do too much. Don't try and jam everything into a short period of time and race around trying to see everything. All you'll do is spend a lot of time in the car and only scratch the surface of the places you're going. Slow down, travel a lot less and just spend longer in those places uh, to really explore them in depth and enjoy them and feel like you've really done the place justice before you move on to the next place. We also got a lot of questions around how far we travel in a day or how many kilometers it's suitable to travel. This really varies again, but and it, it's going to vary not just on your travel pace and how long you've got and how much you're trying to see, but also it's going to vary depending on the area you're traveling in. Some areas of the country will happily travel for three or four hours a day. Uh, if there's not a lot to see and we're just trying to get in between get to the next place or get to the next place of interest. Uh, but sometimes we you know, half an hour is plenty. If we're driving off roads so on gravel roads and things like that, and just with ch caravan travel in general, just keep in mind that you will get tired more quickly driving. There's a lot more to concentrate on, a lot more to think about. And I tend to find after a couple of hours off road driving um, on dirt roads, I'm done for the day. I think it's you're on holidays at the end of the day, or you're traveling. Uh, enjoy that. Don't don't try and push it and go too far. I mean, down here in Tassie, for example, as well, there's very barely a straight road down here, and they're all quite narrow and windy roads. So again, that takes a lot more concentration just to keep on top of things. Make sure you're staying well within your lane and not cutting corners and things like that. So you will find that uh, maybe after only an hour of driving, you're ready to pull up for the day. But as I said, it's really going to depend on what area you're traveling in. Uh, through the middle of the country, yes, there's some big wide open spaces where you will, you know, you might do a three or four hour day. But to be honest, by the time we stop for the kids, uh, you know, or for ourselves to have toilet breaks and, and food breaks, you know, top up on water, grab some groceries, whatever else we might be doing on that travel day, uh, we tend to find that much more than a three hour drive is really starting to push the limits of what we're prepared to do. That being said, we're not early risers either, as you may be aware. We don't get out of bed early and get out of camp early. Uh, we, you know, if we're on the road before 10 a.m., it's a pretty good effort. So by the time we do that and get on the road, stop somewhere for lunch, get into somewhere in the mid Arvo, and then find our next campsite, uh, that's pretty much our travel day done. But that's how we like to travel. Not everyone's like that. Some people like to get up early and get out of there and they're in their new camp before lunch. Uh, you just got to figure out what suits you at the end of the day. There's just a few other things too that we found um, that we didn't initially factor in when we were planning travel days there are things like um headwinds things like that like if you get a massive headwind sometimes it would just go it is not worth driving let's just pull over find a free camp somewhere and just call it for the day as well headwinds caught us out a few times <laughs> they definitely play havoc with your fuel economy and they yeah definitely play havoc with uh, how far you're prepared to drive so yeah make sure you factor those in all of this just comes back to remaining as flexible as you can with your travel plans. It's, it really is important to have some flexibility built into your travel plans as much as you can. Obviously, the longer you're traveling for, the longer your trip is, the more flexibility you're going to be able to have. Uh, but wherever possible, we would highly recommend remaining flexible for so many reasons. But for what, for weather and for unforeseen circumstances, um, it's you, you just can't underestimate the how much more relaxing travel is when you're flexible. Well, that wraps this one up, guys. Hope that gave you a few tips and some ideas of how we go about trip planning and logistics while we're living on the road. Yeah, and saving some money too on the way, which is always handy, which means you can travel further, which Absolutely. is what we're all about. So we're giving away a $100 gift card to the Everything Caravan and Camping website. Yep. How do you enter? Yep. So leave us a comment below this video. Any comment puts you in the draw as long as you subscribe to our YouTube channel and jump over if you're not already and sign up to the Everything Caravan and Camping newsletter. Uh, there's thousands of products on their website. You can jump in there and check out as well. And uh, yeah, we'll be announcing the winner of that in two weeks in the next installment of our off-grid series. Next week though, we're back in Tassie. We're going to finish off uh, a bit of the East Coast the we're doing. East Coast. Oh, we've got some highlights coming up. So, yeah, Wine Glass Bay, Bay of Fires, all coming at you. Stunning. Next couple of weeks. So, Can't wait. All right. Let's do it. See you next right. Sunday. See you Sunday, guys.